Well, after the bye week and at the halfway point of Big E's play, well, in terms of the full amount of games played around the conference after Seton Hall's uh, win on Tuesday, everyone's, you know, 55 total games played in the conference, 55 more to go, well, 60 after this weekend. And right now, as it stands on February the 5th, um, and my 28th birthday, uh, your Seton Hall Pirates are tied for third, along with the Creighton Blue Jays. And we got a lot to talk about. And with more opportunities now for Seton Hall to uh, move up the ladder and keep improving their tournament resume as they got uh, Georgetown and Villanova this week uh, to start the month of February. Welcome to Hoist the Colors. I'm Tim Best. He is Pat Madden. Uh, I mean, let's just get let's just get this thing out of the way. Let's talk about this the the, the Paul game last week. Oh my goodness! Here's the thing. By the way, um, your it was either your theory or it was the, or a combination of your theory plus Bosworth's theory, um, with getting Kadari out to Chicago and giving him fifteen to twenty minutes. Well, that's exactly what happened. He got eighteen minutes. Didn't really need to do much because Seton Hall won 72 to 39. I mean, I'm watching this game and I knew DePaul was bad, but I flipped, I flipped the TV. I switched the channel when it was like, cause I was watching the floor. I'm obsessed with that show on Fox. That show is like cracked to me. Um, and I really think with my acumen and I'm going off topic here, I don't care. I think I can win the two hundred fifty thousand dollars grand prize, or at least twenty thousand for you know the being the best, having the most space at the end of the night. But I digress. So I flip the channel after you know from the floor. I flip it. It's fifteen to two, and I'm like, wait, what? I, I knew we were like we were gonna beat him down pretty badly. I'm like, oh my god, it's fifteen to two, and then DePaul's like they're gonna creep into it. That that's basically all they had, and it was just ugly. I thought DePaul was bad, but oh my god, they were even worse than I thought. What were your takeaways? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hey, look, you have to win the game. You can't just sit there and because you know, on, on it's just one of those things where if you take anybody, you know, even the Paul, even though the Paul probably, I don't know if the Paul would win any conference in college basketball. And I'm even including the MIAC and the SWAC and, uh, you know, whatever the worst or the Big West. I don't think the Paul wins any conference in college basketball. So, you know, and that they're, they're not in the 300 range in the net. And the well, I think they're I think they're in like about the 300 range in Ken Palm. They're not having those numbers for nothing. So you still have but you still have to play because. This is college basketball on any given night. I mean, unfortunately, in non-conference, you see teams in the 300s knock off teams that are ranked. Uh, but I think that Seton Hall did what they had to do, took care of business. Uh, Isaiah Coleman played another big game. Jaden Bediaco uh, realized he didn't have a lot of resistance on the inside, and he scored early and often. Uh, nobody got hurt. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, Richmond came back. Uh showed you know there were i think it, i think there was a period in the second half where he said you know what i'm just going to drive to the basket three times get three get three baskets nobody tried to stop him just so he could show that he was still even though he's coming off whatever injury he's got whether it's a back injury or something else that he's still capable of doing it i made a couple of nice defensive plays as well uh so you know it just it just again it's one of those things you know similar Everyone gets their get right game against DePaul. Seton Hall kind of needed it going in for three game losing streak, and some people starting to get a little worried uh, with the games that Richmond didn't play. But now, you know, we're, now we can swing into February, swing into the last nine games of conference play uh, without having too many questions over the head of this team. It's just crazy to me that you know this team. Seton Hall gave up thirty nine points against. This DePaul team, I know again, DePaul's bad, but I not only was that a season low for points for DePaul, that's the lowest amount of points Seton Hall's given up in a Big East game in quite some time. At the very least, I don't know if this is the least amount of points they've ever given up because you know, like the first almost decade of the conference, that's when I mean they didn't have a shot clock until like eighty five or whatever it was. But I mean, do you think it was? more on Seton Hall's defense or DePaul just being that terrible on offense that 
led to, you know, just again, 39 points on the board for DePaul. Yeah, I mean, you pick it. Let's let's talk this quickly about their game with Xavier on Saturday night. I think it's just a matter of whatever you do the best is going to look, you're going to look really good doing it against the Paul. You know, Butler can score. Xavier can score a lot of points. Uh, you know, Quincy Oliveri scored more points with the 43 he put up on Saturday than the Paul did the whole game on Tuesday night. Uh, so I think you do, if, if you're a good defensive team like Seton Hall is, it's going to show in the fact that Paul's only going to put up 39 against you. If you're a good offensive team, you're probably going to score something in the high 80s or low 90s against the Paul. So I think it's just really a matter of whatever you do well that night when you play DePaul is going to reflect itself. I think it's a reflection of the fact that Seton Hall plays hard nosed defense. It's a reflection of the fact that they take that, that they made a more concerted effort in closing out threes, uh, which is a positive step. Uh, and then we'll see how it translates over uh, when they start playing more competitive games uh, a little bit later in the month of February. I mean, also, I mean, we can't not discuss um, the play at the end of regulation where um, it was, I think, the front end of a one and one, I think. But everyone saw it and it just like it the epitome of the status of DePaul basketball in one play. It was the missed free throw and Deshaun Nelson caught it still in his um in his lane on uh, for uh, you know on the for free for a free throw and he just throws it out of bounds because like he throws it to the referee because he thought you know it was you know ball was dead and he got another free throw he just oh he just threw it back right to him. <laughs> oh, it's a shame it happened to Nelson because Nelson frankly might be the one player on Paul who's actually playing up to expectations. Uh you know, whatever those are for him. But yeah, I mean, that's just, you know, the, the, again, you know, got the one last week. We get to play them at the end of we It's the senior night when, you know, hopefully we do the same thing to them in March. And, you know, the Paul, the Paul is being the Paul. I feel so dirty laughing at DePaul for that because, like, their Twitter fan base is second to none, uh, led by Blue Demon DeGen and Dibs and all those people. They, they're just like, they're just like an elite level of society that we can't comprehend quite yet. And um, I just felt so bad laughing at their expense, but like, they, they're probably laughing too because, like, dude, like this is what it's like to be a DePaul fan. It sucks. You might as well just laugh along with everybody. But yeah, we won't have to worry about DePaul again till again, like you said, the last day of the regular season, March 9th. I mean, that's a long ways away from now. So let's focus on directly on direct. What's directly ahead of us? Um, Pirates back at the Rock Wednesday night against another really bad team. Georgetown's one and nine. Um, Marquette took them behind the shed and just killed them. Cam Jones had 31 in that game. Georgetown's one and nine. Um, And Seton Hall, you know, you called it. You called your shot perfectly when previewing the last matchup back in January where – like Seton Hall's got to get off to a hot start, but they can't let Georgetown hang around because that opens the window of opportunity for them to steal one. And it almost happened. Like, I mean, your prediction could have been more accurate. So what's your um, prediction and like keys for the rematch here? Well, the, there were rumblings coming out of Saturday's game that the Georgetown players were not entirely healthy like there was a there was a sickness running through the roster and that three or four of the players including supreme cook jay neps and uh dontre styles who are three of their starters were playing the game sick uh nobody said anything to that effect uh they had i believe they had just come i think they they have yeah they they the only game they played they had actually had to buy the middle of last week. Mm -hmm. So this was their first game coming back off of uh, the dramatic game up in Providence. Uh, when they, they, they took Providence to the last three minutes 
until uh, Devon Carter just took over and Providence managed to eke out the Ed Cooley Bowl uh, up at the Amp. So they get a week off. You know, they, they should have been feeling a little bit better about themselves. Illness is notwithstanding. Uh, and then they just go in and just don't even bother showing up at home against Marquette after the game a week, two weeks ago, where, you know, Ed Cooley sits away from his huddle, uh, you know, as, as Butler's blowing them out. Uh, so, you know, again, this, there's a lot of parallels, I hate to say it, between Butler and Georgetown, except that, you know, Georgetown has a couple of guys who can really hurt you if they go off. Uh, Jay Nepps obviously put 30 on us uh, down in Washington a month ago. Uh, if he's on, uh, he can he can really he can really ruin your day, so to speak. I don't know. I one of the things I was thinking about, and I didn't look it up, and I should have, was what Epps is shooting, what the splits are between what Epps is shooting at home and what Epps is shooting on, on the road. You know, obviously we've seen him put up a couple of big. We've seen him put two or three huge games up, uh, games playing down in Washington, uh, and he had a big game. Uh, two and a half weeks ago, uh, when they took Xavier down to the wire out in Cincinnati of all places. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to be in a situation like Xavier was in, where you know that they, they have to defend Jay Nepps on a final possession uh, at home. Uh, so I think this is just a matter you got to find a way to make sure you close Epps out. You do a little bit better job against him than you did down down at the Capital One Arena a month ago, uh, and then there's Supreme Cook. Uh, who has been, you know, one of the bigger surprises. Uh, Cook had a big game up in Providence. Uh, you know, ironically, a, a former Fairfield guy, you know, having a big game for a former Fairfield coach. Uh, so even though Cooley didn't coach Cook, obviously, at Fairfield, but uh, it's, just an, it's just interesting to see Cook had a, Cook had a nice game uh, in the game down on the road. Uh, you don't want to see Cook do what he wants. You don't want to see Cook establish himself on the inside uh, because then that get, that keeps Georgetown in the game. Uh, you know, Georgetown's going to have to outscore Seton Hall to beat the Pirates uh, up at the Rock on Wednesday night. And the fewer guys Georgetown gets going in that game, uh, the better. Even Jay Heat, uh, a guy who's not on the list of Ed Cooley favorites right now, if you if you saw the clips of Cooley in the huddle on Saturday afternoon, uh, Jay Heath's another guy who has the potential to go off on you if if he's in the right mindset and he gets the right shots and he starts to see them fall. Uh, so those are the pitfalls of Georgetown is that, you know, as as much as they've had such a, a bad start, they haven't been, at least they've been more competitive more often then I mean, DePaul has. I don't think DePaul's been competitive in any any Biggies game except when they played Georgetown, right? Uh, back in early January. So you know, Georgetown gave us a good game. They gave Xavier a good game. They gave Providence a good game. So this is not the type of team that you want to let hang around, uh, because you know, it's it's just one. You, you just don't want to be in. You don't want to be in the spot, Xavier. I repeat myself. You know. Don't get yourself in a spot where they were within a possession or two in the closing minutes. You know, play some defense, score your points. Because again, Georgetown, as we've seen time and time again this season, Georgetown doesn't play defense. Uh, you know, anybody. You know, I think Dawes had a big game down in Washington. You know, Richmond got almost whatever he wanted in that game. Uh, even Dylan and Dave Wusu had a nice game offensively. Uh, when we played them on the road. And so just get everyone too. going. What? Good defensively, too. Yeah. No, but those guys, just, just play your game. Just remember, this is now February. And now every game, particularly since you've only got the six games in February, every game counts. You know, you don't want to be in that situation where you lose a game like this and then you have to make it up somehow you know, later in the month, it makes the games with Villanova and St. John's uh, later in the month almost must win games uh, because you put a dent. The Georgetown game puts such a dent in your NCAA resume uh, that you need to come up with something almost 
you need to come up with something with as good as the Georgetown loss is as bad if you drop this game on Wednesday night. But I think, you know, given given the way Shaheen Holloway has coached this season, given the way that players like Kadari Richmond and Dre Davis and Alamir Dawes have come in with the proper mindset coming into these games, I'm not particularly worried about how they're going to come out on Wednesday night. So I just off memory and maybe, you know, I mean, if you can, if you can maybe pull it up, but, you know, looking at the home road splits, you know, Georgetown has played five at home, five on the road. Based on the point differential, they've actually, I think they've been better on the road than they have at home, which it's like, they've been more competitive on the road. I mean, they, they put up more of a fight against UConn than anyone anticipated. Um, They almost had a chance to do the funniest thing ever and steal one at Providence a week and a half ago. Um, They, what else? I mean, they almost beat Xavier, like you mentioned, at Cintas. They were relatively competitive at Butler. And then uh, the only game they weren't competitive was the loss at Marquette. And, you know, right after that loss to Butler. So that's yeah, what... no, what's funny is I looked it up and they lost at Butler by 10. And I think it was the week they started Big East play the week before Christmas at Butler at Marquette. Right. They lose at Butler by 10. Uh, they weren't really in it, but, you know, they managed to sneak. They managed to claw back and only lose by 10. They lose by 30 up at Marquette. Uh, but then the, the last two home games they played were against Butler and Marquette. And Butler, they just went out and were terrible in the second half, lost by 24. And then there was the game Saturday against Marquette where they lose by 34. And I think they were down by 40 at some point in that game. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, th- 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 again, you know, I, th- part of, you know, part of the problem Georgetown has at home is, you know, they're playing in front of maybe a thousand people and you can't really get, maybe it's the thing is you talk about the two games, you talk about the Butler game and the Xavier game and the Providence game uh, that they play. Uh, they're playing in front of pretty big and raucous crowds. You know, that Providence game is going to be the loudest, maybe the loudest or second loudest and craziest crowd you're going to see in the Big East all season. Uh, Butler's always got a nice crowd, uh, even if it was a week before Christmas. And even though the Xavier game, I think, was on was on the break, or maybe it wasn't. Um, let me take the date. Uh, no, the Xavier game, I think they had students there, but it was a Friday night, so it wasn't maybe not as crazy. And, you know, Xavier tends to get up for – important opponents but it's still a nice crowd so maybe georgetown it's it's sort of this weird dynamic where you will you want to have a big crowd at the rock on wednesday obviously but sometimes you know jade neps feeds on uh you know feeds on the opposing you know he, he likes being the bad guy walking into an opposing building and when he has to go into you know capital one you know, does do they have the same type of fire, or, or does even Ed Cooley have the same fire? And this, you know, it's it, you know, coaching in front of a thousand people in your home arena has to you know deflate you a little bit. Uh, whereas when you're going into an opposing building and you're going in front of a hostile audience, maybe you do get a little bit more fired up. Maybe you're more into it. So who knows? But you know, leaving that leaving that psychology aside, in terms of the basketball on the court. Uh, Seton Hall has no excuse for this game being anywhere within ten points, and I think if they do what they if they do it they do it against DePaul and what they did through through most of January, I think they should win this game comfortably, and then we can get focused upon the big games that come up later in the month. So you know, looking back in like over the last three seasons, so everything past uh, twenty twenty, you know. Um, Obviously, post Miles Powell graduation. So the last three years, Georgetown has just managed to just hang around all three games. And Seton Hall got off to pretty good starts in these games. And Georgetown just hung around, scared us a little bit. But Seton Hall ended up winning. And I don't know, like something just tells me that this might happen again. I'm, I don't know if they're going to scare us the, the way that they scared, they've scared us the last couple of times. Especially during that, um, the year in which Georgetown went 0 20 in the league, um, the year after they won the Big East tournament for crying out loud, and they almost 
you know, throw a huge wrench in, like, I mean, Seagull's probably going to make the tournament, but a loss to that Georgetown team, which would have been all but a quad four at that point, that would have driven a huge wrench in the tournament resume. And I don't know if it would have kicked us out altogether, but it probably would have sent us to Dayton rather than, you know, an eight spot uh, like they ended up in. Um, and they probably... remember there's a there's a parallel to that, though, which mm -hmm. is that, you know, you hate to say it, but we got them on senior night in 2022, which right. was around the time that, you know, maybe Kevin Willard was talking to some Maryland people. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't quite as obvious as, you know, what Ed Cooley did when, you know, he's he's putting his house on the market and all the rumblings that were taking place when he was, you know, when he had his foot, but was Kevin, Kevin Willard's foot might've, Kevin Willard might've had a foot out the door uh, because then they come back. If you remember the next week after, mm -hmm. you know, Seton all had the, had to fight it out against Georgetown at home on senior night. Then we draw them on the opening night of the Big East tournament and struggled in that game. Uh, I think that was like a four point game as well. Uh, and Georgetown, I think, had an eight or nine point lead in the second half of that game at the Garden. So that sounds right. And then Jameer Harris had to, uh, you know, channel, I guess, <laughs> channel his inner uh, Timmy Ice and, you know, show some ice in the veins, hit a, hit a big three that ends up stealing the deal. I think they were down one. He just comes around a curl, hits a three, and Seton Hall, they barely win the game. But I don't know. Like, that's just a gut feeling. Maybe that's just me being pessimistic. But listen. This is different because of the fact that, you know, Kadari has been given a, re a week to recover and be more closer to 100 percent to play in this game. And, uh, you know, Seton Hall should win this game comfortably. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Seton Hall fans, like, just just be cautious because Georgetown's had a track record the last three years of coming into the Rock, making it a game when they had no business making it a game. So I'm going to be a little weary on that, but, you know, it's up to you, the consumer, and, you know, you, the fans, to mm -hmm. make your judgments about, you know, what to expect and what you think might happen Wednesday night. But if Seattle you know, takes care of business Wednesday night, which I believe they most certainly will, that takes us into a Super Bowl Sunday showdown with Villanova, a team that is the enigma of the conference this year. And, and like, that's without a shadow of a doubt. Like, and the thing is like, it's not like that case could have gone to Providence because of, but here's the thing. Providence at least has an important injury that's affected them, which is, you know, losing Bryce Hopkins a month ago, but Villanova, like they're healthy, but no one can figure them out. Cause they can play like garbage. Like they did for, you know, the several losses that they took in a row after starting um, what, four and one in the big East or something like that. And, and then they lose a bunch of games in a row and then they beat Providence in a game where Providence couldn't hit water. If they fell out of a boat and Villanova ends the ends, their losing streak that way. Like going into this game, Super Bowl Sunday, I'm just going to go in there with no expectations because I don't know what Villanova team is going to show up that day. Well, here's, we do know one thing has been a, one thing ha is usually a constant for Villanova, and that is, you know, Eric Dixon with the ball is one of the most dangerous players in the Big East. Uh, not only can he beat you down low, he can go out to 24 feet and knock down a three. He also is a master at using ball fakes. Uh, you know, that's that's it's it's sort of weird. You know, you watch a lot of Jaden Bediaco, who's going to have the main assignment on Dixon on s s Sunday afternoon. And, you know, Betty Ako likes wandering out, you know, to three-point land to play defense. Uh, you know, we've seen, all, unfortunately, too many times this season when he's been exploited in the pick and roll. Well, you know, Villanova doesn't necessarily pick and roll when they let Dixon go out to 25 feet. Sometimes Dixon stays out there and, you know, hoist up a three and you know he's probably one of the best big men shooting a three in the country definitely the best big man in the big east in shooting the three uh in terms of the volume in terms of the efficiency and in terms of the volume he shoots it. But, you know so the one guy you have to sort of make sure that you've got your eye on uh is eric dixon and i think a lot of teams effectively 
do sort of an inside outside thing with Dixon where uh, they'll let a, they'll let a, let's say they let Seton Hall, let's Dre Davis handle the main defensive assignment, but he's always got Betty Acko in the background uh, to sort of, you know, if, if Dixon manages to get, you know, gets, get past him on, on a ball fake or a drive, you've got Betty Acko sort of there to help out. Uh, you know, Providence did a pretty good job last night of double teaming Dixon. Dixon only had 12 points in that game. Uh, so that it's the one thing is to keep him from taking his shots. Because if you notice the games where Dixon shoots a lot, Dixon's putting up his big numbers, such as the game he played out at Creighton right before Christmas, where he put up 34 points against Ryan Kalkbrenner. Uh, so if, if he can put up 30 pieces on Ryan Kalkbrenner, you know the guy is a scorer. Everyone else on Villanova is sort of hot and cold, depending on, you know, that's why they're the, that's why they're the most unpredictable team in the Big East. Uh, you know, I don't know if Justin Moore is necessarily Justin Moore that you've been, that you were used to seeing two years ago. Uh, but, you know, he's still got some, he's still got some tricks up his sleeve. Uh, and he's still someone who can, you know, hit the occasional three. He's still someone who can back you down uh, defensively. I, I don't know who gets to so I You would think that Dawes will get the call on Mark Armstrong, uh, you know, but the, but Armstrong fell out of the starting lineup for Villanova uh, last week, and they were going with a lineup, I think, of Moore, Hakeem Hart, uh, TJ Bamba, and uh, Burton, Tyler Burton. Uh, so they went with a lineup of Moore, Hart, Burton, Bamba, and Dixon. So you got guys in that lineup for 6'5", 6'6", 6'7", 6'7", and 6'8". Uh, whereas Seton Hall comes at you with a starting lineup of Dawes, who is 6'2", but then you get you know, Richmond 6'6", Davis 6'7", Wusu 6'4". So, you know, in that sense, you know, does if if, let's say, you know, they go with their bigger lineup to start. Does Moore try to take advantage of the fact he's got Alamir Dawes on him? And then what's the response from Seton Hall there? Uh, you know, that that's sort of where, you know, I love Dawes plays good enough defense, but when he's playing a guy who's considerably taller than him, he struggles uh, because, you know, because teams tend to go and Villanova's, been as good as anybody over the years of having their guards feast off uh, having a smaller guy trying to play defense off of them. So that's something to keep in mind when, if and when Villanova goes to bigger lineups uh, and when Armstrong's not in the game uh, because Armstrong is a better matchup physically for Dawes uh, because Armstrong's only six foot two. And then one other guy you got to keep your eye on, which some teams forget to do once in a while, is Brendan Housen. Uh, you know, Brendan Housen has one job, and that is to knock down long-range jump shots. Yep. And he doesn't have to hit a lot of them uh, to help Villanova out. Like last night, for example, uh, he goes, I think he went four for seven from the field. But those three big threes were part of the reason why Villanova went out to, you know, a 20-plus point lead. Uh, so he's the type of guy who, when Villanova is playing well, he makes them play that much better. And that's also something that Seton Hall has to keep in mind, particularly since they've had a they, they've had a tendency to fall behind early in games. Uh, you fall behind a little bit early, and then Brennan Housen hits a couple of threes, and an eight to ten point game becomes a fifteen to sixteen point game in a hurry, and then you're out of it. Uh, because it's it's hard to Butler did it a week and a half ago, but it, on paper it's hard to come back against Villanova when they put you down by in the fifteen to eighteen point range. It, it's hard to come back against anybody, but Villanova in particular because Villanova is still playing one of the slowest tempos in the country, uh, and you know you just don't get the amount of possessions because they bleed the clock. They still can bleed the clock as well as anybody in America. So that's just something where, you know, you don't want to fall behind early and you got to make sure that, you know, you, you've kept you've kept their players in check. 
and that, you know, if, if Seton Hall does go into one of their scoring funks, uh, and they've been prone to do that over the last few couple of weeks, you don't let Villanova just run out on like a 10-0 or 12-0 run and knock yourself out of this game on Sunday afternoon. So my theories is I think Kyle Neptune finally realized that Hakeem Hart is much better coming off the bench. That's why on the Igloo, I had him as my midseason sixth man of the year. So he got bumped back down to the bench, which is more so like an upgrade for him because he's been much better. And Armstrong's been much better as a starter um, than he has been off the bench. So probably for the best, I I would assume Neptune's going to start Armstrong and have Hart be the sixth man. Which again sets up, you know, Dawes guarding Armstrong. You're probably gonna have probably you're gonna have a day Wusu and Richmond guarding more and Bomba vice or vice versa. Dre's gonna have to guard up Burton in all likelihood, and then of course Bediaco on Dixon. Um, which you know, on paper, I'm like, okay, like I I like these matchups, especially when you have a guy of Kadari's length. And agility, he could stifle a guy like TJ Bamba or Justin Moore if Justin Moore could turn back the clock and play like the, you know, the Robin to Colin Gillespie's Batman a couple of years ago, uh, making the, you know, the all regional team in the South region in 2022 on, and route to the final four. Um, you know, obviously, he got hurt in the final seconds of that game against Houston where he messed up his Achilles and honestly he hasn't been the same dude since. Um, shown glimmers, but on a consistent basis, has not been the same dude that has shown has killed Seton Hall um, over the years. Um, as for the rest of the matchup, I mean, I, I just really think that when it comes to Seton Hall, obviously can't ignore the fact that in Philadelphia they have been, you know, haunted almost with the only win in this century coming. Uh, in that 2020 season led by Miles Powell and uh, particularly a big game from Mamu um, who had a double double and, you know, a big, big putback that ended up, you know, putting Seton Hall over the top. Now I really, really like Seton Hall, like to potentially win this game, but there are so many external factors that could favor Villanova, obviously, you know, with the, the historical context, uh, for one, um, I think – and I, I think a lot of it's going to have to do with how each team plays in their respective games prior. Seton Hall against Georgetown at home like we talked about already. Villanova's got Xavier at Centos. Um, I, I really think that I'm going to be judging what happens in each team's performance Wednesday going into this game Sunday. Um, thing is with Villanova, again – you never know what which Villanova team is going to show up. Is it going to be the Villanova team that beat North Carolina in overtime and ran through everyone in the Bahamas? Um, the granted, the win against Memphis is aged like milk, um, but the win against Texas is aged. Texas Tech is aged pretty well, I guess. Um, or are we going to see the Villanova team that blew leads against Butler? Um, are we going to see the Villanova team that? Um, started off so poorly against Marquette and then woke up, came back and took the lead just to lose it again. I don't know, but uh, just for the sake of making what is life, yo cry and making, just making his life hell because he deserves it. And then some, I want to see, obviously, and as a lump too, I want to see Seton Hall win this game so badly more so because I want to see how he reacts. <laughs> well, I, again, I, it's, the other thing you have to keep in mind about Villanova right now is that they are a desperate team. Yep. Uh, they're in a spot in the standings in the Big East that they're not accustomed to, which is, uh, I think they're still, I think they're still in ninth place in the standings. Of like all. they're they're they're, they're, a, they're, they're, they're tied, in a three weeks tied for seventh. They're tied for seventh, so they're in a spot where. Although the flip side to that is that they're also they're also only a game out of avoiding Wednesday night right now. Uh, if you think because Butler's at six and five uh, and holding on to a top Butler, Butler and Xavier are tied for fifth at six and five, which is only a game out from where, you know, Villanova is. So if, you know, any team between, let's say, third and ninth in the conference who goes on a run 
over the next few weeks is going to lock in a spot in the quarterfinals. So, you know, one of the things that I'm sure Kyle Neptune is telling it and probably Jay Wright, because, you know, we know he's still in the building, even if he's not, you know, even if he's not officially, you know, got a role with the team, I'm sure that, you know, he can show up at practice and give a five minute speech about, you know, villain of a teams have been down even the 2020 team that we've referenced a couple of times. Uh, we had them three games out of the conference race after winning that dramatic game in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, I think it was the second weekend in February, around this time in February, four years ago. And then Villanova, you know, we lose a couple of games that we shouldn't have lost down the stretch that season. I think Villanova went off and went uh, after that game. They went uh, six and three uh, the rest of the way and managed to four, managed to get into the three-way tie uh, for the regular season conference title with Seton Hall and Creighton. Uh, so they've been in this spot before. I mean, they, they're focused on two different things right now. One is getting an at-large NCAA bid, and the only thing that's really a blemish on their record in that vein is getting wins. You know, 12 and 10, you can't end up two or three games over 500 overall regardless of what your net is, regardless of what your quad one wins are, they have to win games between that. In their next nine games, the goal is to get as many wins as possible. Uh, so every game, they're going to, you know, if, if if they've got the mentality that, you know, a Justin Moore and an Eric Dixon have from that Final Four team two years ago, the mentality is win every night. Doesn't matter if you're playing Seton Hall. Doesn't matter if you're playing Georgetown doesn't matter if you're playing uh, Creighton. You just got to get wins. And I think they just see this game like they see the game at Xavier uh, earlier in the week, and they see some of the games coming up as just just get Ws. You know, get to 17 wins. Get to 18 wins. And then you get to that point where their high standing in the net and their quad one wins propel them to an at-large bid. I mean, I think it sort of sticks – in the craw of Dixon and Moore and Kyle Neptune that they missed the NCAA. Uh, Villanova teams aren't supposed to miss the NCAA tournament, regardless of what they had to get through last season, uh, you know, in terms of more missing most of the season. So, you know, this is the revenge month for Villanova. You know, that they're, they're gonna, you know, if if Villanova's got any meant if Villanova's got any pride left, you know, they're gonna come out hard every game the rest of the season and that includes you know that includes sunday afternoon you know it's it's one of those things where you're playing on super bowl sunday you know there aren't a lot of games there aren't a lot of college basketball games going on uh i don't i think the game's on fox i don't think the game's on national fox if i remember oh, 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 are you talking about cbs uh, sports network yeah you yeah. get to hear steve lapis <laughs> but anyway the, i guess the point is that you know, it's it's just it's what I for some reason Super Bowl Sunday seems to mean more, uh, because you know it it just it it just is what it's such a big day, uh, in in terms sports wise, you know, and and people it's just one of those things where I I think certain I think in certain situations you have to come up fire it up to play, uh on Super Bowl Sunday, sort of like an unofficial national holiday. So this is the type of thing where that crowd, uh, I think it was, I think it was last season. They played, did they play Providence? No, they played Providence the day of the NFC championship game, but the NFC championship game is taking place in Philadelphia. Yes. Uh, yes. I and remember that now. And unfortunately they lost, but that was, I think Moore's second game back. So I right. think it's one that they, and again, the flip side is if you're Seton Hall, you also have to walk in with that type of mentality. Uh, I think I, I don't know if I meant, I think I mentioned this off the air last, last week, but I remember a game my freshman year, this is 32 years ago. Oh yeah. Where Sunday, after, Super Bowl Sunday, right before I think it was the, the Bills against the, the Washington, they were known as the Washington Redskins at the time, yeah. Super Bowl 26. Uh, but before that, you know, I think it was a one o'clock start at the old Brendan Byrne Arena, mm -hmm. where 
an unranked Seton Hall had been ranked going into the season, but had some struggles in the non-conference. And I think lost a couple of early conference games. So they were unranked, but coming in to the Meadowlands was a number six Ohio State team led by, you know, one of Fox's extraordinary color guys, Jimmy Jackson. Uh, and that was a game Seton Hall managed to win, I think, by six points. I think it was like 91-85. I'd have to, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but, you know, that's the type of thing where, you know, the crowds fired up to go watch the Super Bowl later on. And they're going to come into uh, the Wells Fargo Center. And, you know, everyone's going to be psyched up for the Super Bowl. And, you know, that that's going to be, depending on what type of turnout uh, they get in Philadelphia, that's a game where you got to you gotta really have an edge. Go, you got to have an edge mentally going into that game. And, again, if you look at the technical way things look on paper, you know, it's, it's going to be a hard task for Villanova to contain Hidari Richmond. Uh, you know, they, they, Villanova sometimes has their own struggles on the defensive end. Uh, so there might be openings for Alamir Dawes to hit a couple of shots. Uh, the Dre Davis, Tyler Burton matchup is interesting because they're two players cut basically from the same cloth. Uh, they're both basically guys who can score any place on the, on the, on the court. Uh, they both are aggressive in attacking the offensive and the defensive boards. Uh, and, and it's just one of those things where, you know, sometimes in matchups like this, it's who wants it more. And you know, as much as Villanova is a desperate team coming in, you know, getting a win Sunday, you know, puts you that much closer to an at-large bid. It gives Seton Hall another quad one win. It probably bumps Seton Hall up in the net, which, you know, right now they're, 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 their net position is not particularly good. I think we're going to talk about bracketology if Seton Hall is still important in that subject, you know, later in the month. But, you know, you got to think about it. Now you're getting into the second week of February when people start looking at that stuff. And you get one more big win, and that not only helps nail down an at-large bid, you also have to think a little bit about seeding uh, because you don't want to be in a spot where, you know, you you would have to settle for a first four game. And a lot some of the bracketology out there has Seton Hall either in the first four or just above the first four. And if you don't manage to take care of business as much as you can over these next, you know, few weeks, you know, Seton Hall is still going to be in that conversation, you know, regardless of what happens the first, you know, what happens the first couple of weeks of March and in the Big East tournament. So another thing I was just thinking about, by the way, I know you talked about, you know, Betty Ako and how he tends to get crossed up and tends to lose his guy. If he's guarding, you know, a big in this case, it'd be Eric Dixon. If he pops out to the three point line, or it, well, before he would hedge out way too far and, you know, he'd lose a guy on a roll. He could lose a guy in a pop here and Dixon, you know, we all know what he's capable of shooting wise, but one guy I'm thinking about his performance, I think could be a key in this game, an icebreaker, if you will, Elijah Hutchins Everett, because he himself is a big who shoots threes. I mean, not a lot of them, but when he does get his opportunities, he's not afraid to take them. And he's actually got a good looking shot. Um, someone in our Seton Hall Twitter group chat uh, point out that like with his shot, like he gets good rotation on the ball. Um, so like he can, he can knock him down because he's got good enough of a shot. And I think because of that, I think he can defend the three well as well. So Betty Ako is not really closing out on potential three point shots that Dixon's taking that well. Look to Elijah Hodgins effort to try to do, to make up for that, um, especially even just scoring output as well. Betty Yako's having a tough time scoring the ball on the interior. If he's just not getting them to fall and if his defense, not quite, if he's not getting enough on the defensive end against Dixon, look for EHE to potentially, you know, right those wrongs or even, you know, improve upon if Betty Yako's playing well uh, to win that battle in the paint and put this team over the top and steal one in Philly. And let, let's get one last point out there about this is that, you know, as opposed to Jay Wright teams, 
Uh, and Wright was notorious for playing a six or seven man rotation. Uh, you've got four, you've got at least three or four big bench pieces. Uh, you've got probably Hakeem Hart coming off the bench. I, and you mentioned what Hart's capable of. We mentioned Brendan Housen, who comes off the bench, gives them between 10 and 20 minutes, and again, can scare you by knocking down a few threes. And then you got two guys we didn't mention. You've got the uh, you've got Jordan Longino, who has been a bit of a revelation because he's been oft injured the last two seasons, but because he's been healthier this season, uh, he's been a much, much bigger contributor uh, to what uh, Villanova does. And then you've got their backup big, uh, Lance Ware, uh, who, who has been, you know, struggled a lot earlier in the season, but is starting to find a little bit of a rhythm coming off the bench and, you know, helping, you know, helping and giving spotting Eric Dixon in minutes. And, and one thing Ware does, which is entirely different than he gives you an entirely different dynamic than what Dixon does, uh, because while Dixon, uh, does a lot of his damage outside of the paint. Ware is almost an exclusively an inside the paint type guy. Uh, and he wasn't a top, he wasn't a four-star prospect uh, coming out of high school for nothing. Uh, he might have languished a little bit playing at Kentucky before he transferred to Villanova. And he might have had trouble getting his footing down in a new system under Kyle Neptune. But Ware has played better over the last couple of weeks for Villanova. And, you know, that's that's the thing where, you know, Seton Hall sometimes does not play the deepest rotation. You talk about Everett and you talk about Isaiah Coleman coming off the bench. Uh, but after that, you know, you get, you know, you get Jaquan Sanders, who hasn't really been what anybody was expecting him to be. He's been a little bit of a disappointment this season. Uh, you know, do you is David Tubek healthy enough to give a few minutes uh, do we get to see Sandre Naganga, uh, who we've seen bits and pieces of? Uh, so, I mean, that that's really Vill Villanova for the first time in a lot of these matchups this season has had an edge in terms of the bench, uh, which is something you did not see during the Jay Wright era. So that might be something else which comes into play, you know, particularly since, you know, again, you know, Seton Hall doesn't play the deepest rotation and Villanova has been getting some contribution uh, from some of these bench pieces. So, you know, just to wrap this up, you know, overall prediction for the game. I mean, I'll start it off. You know, I think Seton Hall is more than capable of winning it. Again, I think I'll have a more accurate prediction based on their performance Wednesday night against Georgetown. Same goes with Villanova's performance against Xavier on the road uh, that same night. Um, I think obviously Seton Hall is more than capable of winning this game. Um, I think if you're Seton Hall, I, I think winning it would be outstanding. If you lose, though, don't get yourself into a situation where you end up like Providence and you just you just lay a complete egg and it's a complete dud of a performance where you're not making shots, your stars aren't you know playing up to the level that they're expected to play. The bench also is non-existent. And you're also just not not knocking down shots. So I think that's going to be the big thing. If if Seton Hall loses, just don't get killed because that's what the the net is very driven by point differential. I don't know. I mean, I think it's a little too too much emphasis on that. But as long as Seton Hall just plays competitive like they have the last three years, I think it's been a single digit game down down south in Philly each of the last three years, um, you know, four years as well, you know, 2020, you know, notwithstanding, but that being a Seton Hall win, but the three games they've lost the last three years at Villanova have been decided by combined 12 points. So four points, your average margin of victory for Villanova. So that Seton Hall could very well win this game, but obviously the big thing is just don't pull a Providence in this game and don't get killed and don't look terrible on offense. And yeah. That's my synopsis. And then you don't want to set, unfortunately, a bad pattern going forward because then you have the three games after that are huge games. Uh, you've got Xavier coming in on Valentine's Day. Then you've got the trip out to Long Island to play St. John's. And then after that, you've got Butler coming in. Uh, and, you know, you, 
all three of those teams are are winnable games. But if you but if you start to fall into the wrong mindset, like this is this is the type of Villanova is the type of team that falls into I think a similar category to the bad run that Seton Hall got into before riding the ship. You know, you got Creighton, you had uh, Providence, and then you had Marquette. You don't want to sort of get into that, you know, can we beat a legitimate Big East team or can we beat, can we be competitive? Are we going to play our game against a legitimate Big East team? Uh, and, you know, that's that's the type of, you know, because, again, I think if Seton Hall's playing the way they played earlier in January, uh, they certainly were playing at a level better than any, not, in, but that's, that's a, I, let me backtrack that a little bit. In terms of what Seton Hall's ceiling is, uh, their ceiling is more than capable of knocking off a Villanova team. Uh, but it's a matter of, you know, getting to that level, you know, making sure that, again, you don't let Villanova take the big runs against you uh, that their offense and their talent is capable of. And, and then making sure that you play that that you that you play solid defense uh, against players who are certainly capable of scoring, you know, as much as they haven't played up to their potential on a lot of nights, uh, you know, you there's there could be that North Carolina or that Memphis game lurking in the bag for Villanova. And you've got to do whatever you can to keep that from getting out on Sunday afternoon. And by the way, something I just realized too, uh, six years ago, Seton Hall played at Villanova on Super Bowl Sunday. And this was the year that Villa, you know, the Eagles won the Super Bowl against Tom Brady and the Patriots. Um, you know, the, they were fired up, um, and this was, you know, the you know the Brunson Bridges led team with DiVincenzo as the sixth man off the bench, arguably better than 2016, which is saying something. And that was a, I mean, that this is the last year. This is my senior year too. This is the last year of Delgado and Carrington and Desi and Ish, and um, and Villanova. You know, they they did what Villanova does. They were number one in the country at the time, and they won like by 16. And that was, I guess, a damn good Seton Hall team uh, that season. Obviously not as good as like 2020 or 2016, but still a damn good team. So, you know, I don't think it'll be deja vu in the sense that Villanova is going to channel 2018 because, let's be real, 2024, no, even if they shoot 100% from three, they are still they still don't want to channel that 2018 team specifically. Um, but, again, if you can win the game, great. But just don't get killed. Like that that's gonna be my big thing. Um, so to come out of this week one and one, I'll be more than happy with, but you gotta beat Georgetown. Like that's just that goes without saying, just take care of your business, beat Georgetown. I don't even care how much you beat them by, but just like four weeks ago. Like, I don't care how much you beat Georgetown by, just win the game. And then if you can find a way to beat Villanova, even better. That'll be like the icing on top of the cake to take you to nine and four in Big East play with that big three game stretch against teams in the middle of the pack. Xavier, who's trying to make more of a tournament case after such a tough non conference start, losing five games to Oakland and Delaware. And then you got, a, I think, a more than winnable game going to UBS to play St. John's. Uh, I think the matchup is a good one for Seton Hall, but we'll get into more of that when the time comes, and then to finish off a sweep against Butler, who has quality road wins against Marquette, and now Creighton. Like, I think if you can win all three of those games, putting yourself at 12-4 and four potentially in the Big East, or at worst 11-5, and five, I, I I think we're a lock at that point, uh, just as long as, you know, um, don't lose to DePaul after that. But again, we're getting way too far ahead of ourselves. Uh, before we sign off, Pat, any last words? I don't think anything, again, you, you just want to see them play well. Uh, I do think it's important, and, you know, the, the, you know Brian Felt, meant, the athletic director, mentioned it last week. The website's got it. The, the, the account's got it mentioned this week. I think, you know, look, look these are these midweek games, particularly against opponents that are not ranked, uh, can be tough games to get, particularly Valentine's Day next week. Uh, can be tough games to get fans to get to. Uh, but I think it's important that, you know, the, the team knows that people have their support uh, going into the end of the season. And, you know, as much as you say, well, you know, Georgetown sucked, 
Georgetown stinks. Uh, the game might not be that exciting. You know, just keep in mind that, you know, if you're a fan, they still need to win this game in order to, you know, because they lose a game like this. And that could be the thing, which is the difference between making the NCAA tournament and having to settle for the NIT again. So just get, you know, do you know, make sure that you're there or make sure you're watching on Wednesday night. You know, don't take this game for granted simply be, you know, because Georgetown's, you know, Georgetown's still a Big East team. You know, it's still, you know, and it's still every game in in the sense that, you know, it might not be a team that's competing for a conference title. It might not be a team that's going to win 10 games this season, but it still means something. So, you know, if you've got if if you weren't planning on going, you know, try to do it. You know, treat it like you would treat any other big game. Don't say because Georgetown, and it's still Georgetown. I mean, think about it. You know, think about how awful it was through most of the history of the Big East. You got beat up by Patrick Ewing. You got beat up by, you got beat up a little bit by Alonzo Mourning. You got beat up by Allen Iverson. You got beat up by Jeff Green. You got beat up by uh, Hibbert. Uh, just think about all the times that Georgetown walked in to our building and beat us up. And now now the shoe is concealedly on the other foot where, you know, you can get a pound of revenge against a Georgetown team that is definitely not definitely a shadow of what they were 20 and 30 years ago. So it's still a long time Big East rival. And I think that, you know, fans should still take this this game on Wednesday night, seriously. Amen to that. And like, again, you're like, you're preaching to the choir. Cause I was preaching these basically the same sermon uh, when I was running Bluebeard army. And I, I, I hope, and I, I know, and I hope that JT Nordenson guest of ours from about a month and a half ago, I feel like he's preaching the same exact message to the student body right now. Like they, they, these obviously are far from sexy games on paper, but you know, Georgetown, like these are games you got to win. And, you you can play a role in that you know like you it's any team can win on any given night so if you don't bring the energy especially if the teams don't bring the energy they could lose to a team like georgetown which again you you believe it or not you do play a role so if you can show out bring the energy and help cheer this team on because last year you know there was year one of shots playing now we're in year two this this is more of his roster and his guys back his guys up give them the support they deserve because the expectation for us even this year when the expectations were low the goal was to still make the ncaa tournament the expectation still to make the ncaa term especially now with how we've been to start biggies play halfway through if you want to see this team go back to the tournament you're gonna you play as much of a role as their performance on the court, you can affect their performance in such a positive way to win these games. When, uh, you know, again, I'm trying to think of like, I'm trying to think of a good example here, or like the right wording, but in the overall message, you know, if the guys feed off your energy, so, and feed off the population and, you know, feed off the numbers too, of the people that make their way into the Prudential center. So, Make your way to the Rock if you can on Wednesday night and for every other home game the rest of the season. There's still five more to go. Five more very winnable opportunities considering we've gotten past UConn and beat them. We got Marquette and beat them. Should have beaten Creighton, but we still took them to triple overtime, damn it. Um, So now that those are in the rearview mirror, it's a much more relaxed slate of home games to end the season all five winnable opportunities just just come out to the rock um and and bring the energy and and if you're not in the building at least show the guys some love you know on social media especially when they do well and win these games and even when the even if they lose listen pick them right back up because the last thing you want to do is pull it what is life yo and i'm going to bring this full circle and don't say I, I'm a multi-graduate, multi-graduate of Villanova University and my parents donate $50,000 on 1842 day and Kyle Neptune's an abomination and will not be donating until he's fired. Like, don't be like Joseph. Just don't, okay? <laughs> Just, again, support these guys the rest of the way. They need it. And they they want to 
show out and do well for all of us, alumni and fans, or both fans and alumni who are fans, like like the two of us. So just that's my message, and I feel like I'm just beating a dead horse here. So this is where we're going to end this episode. Thanks for tuning in once again to Hoist the Colors. For Pat Madden, I'm Tim Best. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next week. Uh, with Hopefully we get to talk about two wins. Hopefully we get to talk about at least one win and then get you ready for a couple big games against Xavier at the Rock and then a little road trip to Long Island on Sunday, uh, February 18th to take on the Johnnies at UBS. So until next time, onwards to Tonia. Take care, y'all.